Brought some problem. Okay, so now that we're all assembled, um, I think we'll start this session, which is looking at the global context for abortion rights in 2017. And we're very fortunate to have Louise Melling, Sinead Kennedy, and Les Alambi uh, to present in respect to this topic, um, and also to have, I think, contribution in the discussion also from Francis Radai, whom you heard from earlier on. Um, so each of the speakers have 20 minutes, um, and I think we're going to start with Louise Melling. Um, Louise, as you might know, is, a de is the Deputy Legal Director at the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, and the Director of its Centre for Liberty, which encompasses the ACLU's work on reproductive freedom, women's rights, lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender rights, freedom of religion um, and belief and disability rights. Um, so she effectively leads, as I understand it, the uh, work of the ACLU um, to address the intersection of religious freedom and equal treatment, among other issues. And prior to becoming Deputy Legal Director, Louise was Director of the ACLU Reproductive Freedom Project, um, where she oversaw nationwide litigation, um, communications research, public <coughs> education campaigns, and advocacy efforts in state legislatures. So pretty busy overall. Um, I wonder how much she's going to be able to say in 20 minutes, or if we should perhaps uh, extend the time. But. Um, Let's start with that at least. And um, Louise, I think, if, do you want to address us from the stand? Or are you happy to sit? I'm happy to sit. Great. That works for people. Yeah. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, a shout out to the ICCL for convening us. Thank you to the speakers before from whom I've learned so much. And thank you to every activist in the room who's working to make life better for women throughout the globe. Um, I'm here from the United States where abortion is legal, where the federal constitution has protected it since 1973. But as you all know, it is hotly contested. It, it is hotly contested, not just in this administration, but really pretty hotly contested in different degrees for 40 years, 40 plus years now. So I want to talk a little bit about what that contest looks like. And then from where I sit, I just wanted to offer a few reflections about like, if I were starting from scratch, what I might think about doing or whatever, what I wonder whether we did it right. And of course, you know, I'm coming from the United States, which I sometimes feel is just a parochial beast and don't know whether the lessons you know, extend out further. And also you could say, why would we listen to her lessons? Because how's it going over there? <laughs> But nonetheless, I'll offer some, some views. So first of all, it was a decision of the United States Supreme Court. It wasn't legislation. It was the United States Supreme Court decision in 1973 that recognized that the federal constitution protects the right of a woman to decide to end her pregnancy if that's what she wishes, decided on privacy grounds. Um, it's a decision between a woman and her doctor. Doctor featured big in the decision as opposed to a decision for the government to make the court reasoned that way, even though the decision arose sort of in the heat and passion of, of the women's rights movement at that time, the court said, you, no state can ban abortion before viability. It left some room for some regulation before viability, and that room for regulation before viability has now been, um, that invitation has been extended. Before I talk about that extension, I'll just say, after viability, the court said you still can't ban abortion if it's necessary for a woman's health or life. The, ex the uh, invitation was even more robustly made by the Supreme Court in 1992, saying that states can regulate abortion in the interest of protecting fetal life or in the interest of a woman's health, as long as it doesn't constitute an undue burden on a woman's right, an undefined term creating for decades of litigation by people like me and other people at the ACLU, the Center for Reproductive Rights, and others. Um, that invitation, states are just jumping right up, stepping up to that. And so here's the kind of things we see, many of which you already know about, I think. There's the regulation of facilities. You heard a lot about that probably even in your countries in the context of Texas. For example, regulations to make facilities that provide abortions look like hospitals. Read. Make, a, make it impossible for them to stay open so they have to close and justify this in the name of women's health. Lots of regulations of what I'll say, women. I mean, I realize these are all regulations of women, but regulations of the following sort. You have to listen to a state-mandated script in person. Then you have to come back in person some period of time later, 24, increasingly 48. Now we're seeing 72 hours later. 
that's true no matter how firm your conviction was, that's true no matter how, mad, bleh, no matter how inconvenient it is for you. Increasing rules that you must have an ultrasound and that the doctor has to describe the ultrasound to you or show it to you or offer to show it to you or have you listen to the heartbeat. One state, the requirement is that the doctor has to tell you that abortion kills a, a unique living human being. Um, regulations designed to discourage, shame, punish, right? Um, there are also another category, I'll say, that we, we're seeing no to ban abortions for reasons of fetal anomaly or in particular to ban abortions for reasons of Down syndrome as a way to try to create a divide between different movements in the United States. Bans on race selected abortions. We didn't know there were race, there are no race selection abortions. That again is meant to play into, a, tap into a, a campaign by some saying that the most dangerous place for an African-American child in America is in its mother's womb. That abortion is black genocide. And just to give you a flavor of what it's like in the United States. Bans on sex selection abortions, which I view as like trying to buy into stereotypes based on um, immigration and in particular stereotyping of Asian Americans and casting doubt on abortions in different communities. So that's, oh, we, could, we can keep going. But that's kind of a flavor of what happens. We sue, we challenge, some things we strike, some things stick. The things that stick aren't usually the things that are the most dramatic. The most dramatic we can, we can, we can take down. The things that stick, so we think of them kind of as one brick. So one brick may not be terrible, not good, but not terrible. But if you have one brick put in in 2010, a couple more put in 2011, and you keep going, all of a sudden you have a wall that a woman must jump. And as you can well imagine, as we heard from the discussion before, the wall is the greatest, the highest when it comes to access for poor women and rural women in, in America as in, as in other places. I think that the, re the restrictions, you know, they do many things, obviously, right? They obstruct, they punish, they punish you for having sex and not conforming to a stereotype. They shame, they shame women, they shame doctors. Um, but what they also do is keep the conversation hot, right? Every single one of these restrictions serves from those who are, who are putting it forward as a way of saying, abortion, it's not that safe. We have to step forward for women. You know, abortion, immoral, we have to protect. We have to make sure you really know what it is because it's such a major decision. And we don't trust that you know that that's why we're going to make you go through it. It is a way that the contest keeps going. So the decision, <laughs> definitely didn't shut down the conversation in the states in, in that manner. Um, so I'm just going to talk about what I think some of the lessons are when I kind of look at this situation. The first, I think, is pretty obvious from what I've just said, which is don't be sanguine about a win. <laughs> uh, you know, are getting the Supreme Court decision. I, I was, you know, rural and young, so didn't really celebrate it. We didn't have a TV. I don't really know what my, how I would have learned. Um, I guess there were papers. I read the comics. Uh, but don't be sanguine about a win. This is an incredibly important win that was you know, celebrated. But I assume right, the activism was to get this win. Like we talk about you know, repealing or getting a win as opposed to sort of um, bracing ourselves that the fight continues even after that and that you have to stay in. And you have to stay in even when the fights are sort of I'll just say less obvious, or sometimes I say in the world where there's so many challenges, is the waiting period the place where you put your energy? A waiting period it doesn't look like a ban. But the other side, especially after that win, is, is all the more motivated. They, they, they were in a struggle as well, and now there's a loss. And if you think about the loss, if you think about the loss, particularly if you're somebody who believes abortion is murder, then there's real reason to show up. So there's reason for people to show up, and in the United States, People who are really committed um, to stop abortion are very motivated. And now the political dynamic is such that the, po the political forces, and in particular now it's really the Republican Party. I'm from a nonpartisan organization. I'm not saying this is a partisan thing, but more as a factual matter about what it looks like in America, which is that the Republican Party has knows that this is a motivator, knows that this gets people to the polls, and therefore uses this as an issue. We saw that, I, th I think, in the last election, last presidential election. I don't think that Donald Trump personally has a stake 
in whether abortion is legal or not. That's not what his prior history suggested. But he sat on 60 Minutes and said he would appoint justices who would work toward the reversal of Roe because he knew that that would help shore up a base that was not necessarily his and it would drive people to the polls. Some say that that vacancy on the Supreme Court is what decided the polls because of that animation. So um, anticipate that this battle will go on and I think even build it into thinking about how you motivate and engage people so that people are in it as much as people can be for the long fight, not just for, not just for the big win, but to keep going. Um, the second, at least as I think about it in the States, is to keep the values conversation going. There's been a lot of values conversation here today. It's pretty refreshing. Um, because I think, at least for us, you know, four decades in, there's two different kinds of, there's a kind of shorthand. You know, one of my friends who moved to the States recently said, oh, so it's, it's pro-life versus choice. Like, you guys, you didn't pick a good word. Um, but it's come down to to that kind of shorthand, as opposed to that we support you know, the right to women's health, we support agency, agency about our health, agency about our family, agency about how we survive, agency just about having a, a shot to survive or a shot to finish school or a shot to take care of our kids. Um, and, and then translating that value, if I, said to my, if I said to my siblings, like, oh, this is about agency, they'd be like, what? Um, back to somebody made the point, forgive me, but to, I, think, I think it was you. Um, figuring out how also to talk about that in a way that is understandable and meaningful to, to people. But the value, we're all here because we value what this means to people's lives. But I think we sometimes lapse even publicly into shorthand in a way that doesn't remind people. At the time in the states when Roe was decided, I think there was, it was clear that morality was on our side in the same way that, you, that so many of you have discussed. When you have women literally dying, when you have women winding up sterilized, when you have women otherwise suffering tremendous health consequences, um, that people can see, that people understand because of the illegality of, um, of abortion, people step up. Um, but then once abortion becomes legal in, in our country and you don't, see, you don't see the harm the same way, harm is still happening, but you don't see it in the same way, it becomes all the more important, I think, to continue to articulate. And don't assume people have memory, not in the States, right? in terms of like historical memory of why this mattered. Um, I think, so a third is just, I have to remind myself to do this a lot, Remember what you're asking of people. Like we want to gin up activists. We want people to have more people be wholeheartedly believe in the importance of access to abortion for people's lives. But there's a whole bunch of people, and there was a reference again earlier, who would never choose abortion for themselves, might even say in some manner that they're, oppo that they're opposed to abortion, but would support the right for other people. I wouldn't do it for myself, but I don't think we should get in the way of somebody else. So how do we find, make sure that we temper our language so that we talk to different people or that we talk in a way that can open up ears to people? So the difference between saying, you know, I'm here because I think uh, abortion is a human right. Some people who believe us will go along with that, but other people who haven't yet really thought about it may think that's too hard a conclusion. So sometimes we this is based on like clinical psychologists and other people sort of talking about one way to let people hear you is to say, we may not all agree about abortion, but we surely can agree, you know, that the government shouldn't ban it or that the government shouldn't behave in a way that hurts the chance for women to control their lives or to protect our safety. So that people who may not yet hear or might be at least neutral can at least hear and come into the conversation. I look back and I also think, you know, um, what are we asking of the government in some way? Are we asking the government when we have these campaigns simply to lift the ban? Are we also imagining a future? This is this may this this may be very American, where where abortion could actually become part of the healthcare system. Abortion where there would be more efforts made by the government to enable women to access abortion so that it's not only a negative right, but there's a positive dimension. The States is not 
you know, we are not the model for anybody in terms of positive assistance, particularly around health care. But, you know, there's a robust debate in the states about because the right was argued and one is a privacy right, did we limit people's imagination? I frankly think that the United States, you can call it a duck, you can call it privacy, you can call it equal protection, you can call it anything you want, and in the states it's going to be, we're seeing it contested, it's not the name, but that may not be true in your countries in terms of thinking about, like, what's the real vision you want, and even at the beginning, can you think about that vision and insert it into how you run your campaigns in some manner, if that makes sense. Um, then, I, this is my, this is like, uh, don't be the frog in the water that keeps getting heated up uh, in some sense, or watch those things that look small and how they add up. In the States, we very soon after Roe had the states, many of the states, um, pass laws that said that institutions and individuals didn't have to provide abortion services if they had moral or religious objections. It was very fast that that came on, and it came on, I think maybe everybody, first of all, very hard to oppose in the States, um, and also this, the win was still there. Um, very soon after, at the, around the same time, the federal government stripped abortion out of the Medicaid program. I think there was like a three-year period where abortion was in the Medicaid program. Medicaid is the government insurance program for the poor. Soon thereafter, we had some states ban abortions in public hospitals. Those things have all stuck. Um, there's no abortion access in any government insurance program. We, we kind of went, we went from a, you don't have to do it if you think it's immoral, to the government dollars don't have to support it. In fact, we can favor childbirth, to then a subsequent Supreme Court decision that said the government can use its power to favor, not even just with money, but otherwise to favor childbirth. So the, the backdrop, what I call like the wallpaper of our culture, has the US government stepping away from something that's a constitutional right. The US government stepping away from something that even the Supreme Court acknowledges is necessary for women's health. It's, um, you have a message that it's immoral, at, at, I think, or at minimum, icky, right? We, the government will distance itself, public hospitals can distance itself, all insurance can distance itself, doctors can distance themselves. And I think that adds up to contribute to the backdrop in which we find ourselves in such a contested battle. Each one of those things we recognize was bad, but I'm not so sure we recognized about how bad they all were when they got added up. The other is, and I, I'll just sort of end with a, a final, which is, to put women in the picture, and I think if Fiona and I understand, I heard you definitely talking about pregnant people, and I'm mindful of the difference between pregnant people and talking about women. In the States, I think most of these measures are targeted at women, so I'm, I'm prepared to talk about women. But I've done it here today, and I think a lot of us have done it. We talk about abortion. Abortion is the thing that's most controversial, right? I think that's probably a word that have, uh, um, evokes the image of the procedure, but we don't, we don't put the person in the picture. I'm not stepping away from the word abortion, I'm asking to add a person. Um, we don't talk about how women need abortions, about what, how this matters for women. I mean, we do, but our shorthand often leaves out the person. Um, and I think when we talk about the people, so I think that matters. I'm watching the difference between what happens with reproductive rights in America and what happens with LGBT in America. We have a case before the Supreme Court that people talk about as the cake case, um, but most people don't really talk about it as the cake case. They talk about it as the couple being turned away because they wanted a, a cake, the couple being gay. People don't talk about the woman being turned away at the hospital because of what she wanted was an abortion. We don't talk about people being, women being turned away from the doctor in the same kind of frame. We talk about the hospital not providing abortions. We've left out the woman, and at least in the states, the frame of discrimination, people may not all agree on all the details, but they know they're not supposed to support discrimination. <laughs> um, so it changes the conversation, so that's one way in which putting the woman in, I think, is really important. I think putting all women in, um, we sometimes talk in the office like how important it is not to just talk about what the politics think of as the good girls, the women who didn't want sex or who wanted to continue the pregnancy. Those women are real, 
those women need to be talked about, but that is not the full story. The full story is like the full room and the many, many different reasons why. And if, we, if we're afraid to talk about the full diversity of people and why we seek abortions and why it matters to us in different ways in our lives, we risk letting some women get stigmatized and leaving them more vulnerable to be cut out. So it all goes back to the basic proposition that we've been talking about all day. What, what our laws say about abortion says a lot about what we say about women. It says a lot about whether we think that women are entitled to be sexual beings. It says a lot about whether we think women are entitled to, to decide not to pick up the, the mantle of, of motherhood at particular points in their lives or ever. It says a lot about whether we think we can trust women, trust women to think, trust women to be compassionate, trust women to make fundamental ethical decisions. It says a lot about whether we just respect women and think that we can think and be. So thank you. Hope, good luck with your fights. May they go better. <laughs> Thank you, Louise, and you, you certainly did manage to squeeze a lot into those 20 minutes. Um, and I think it's a lot, a lot of what you've said certainly resonates in both the global context, but also this context. And I have so much more I want to say about that, but I'm not going to because I'm going to restrain myself at this point and introduce Sinead Kennedy, who is Secretary of the Coalition to Repeal the Eighth Amendment. Um, that is a coalition many of you may know, but it's basically um, a coalition of 100 organizations that campaigns to repeal the Eighth Amendment um, to protect um, and respect women's lives, health and choices. And Sinead also teaches in the English department at Maynooth University. And she's written widely on cultural politics and feminism. Um, again, many of us are um, familiar with her work, The Abortion Papers, Volume 2, by it, if you haven't already. Um, and she's also uh, completing a book currently on the Eighth Amendment. Um, Sinead, I think it says in the bio that she's also been active for many years in pro-choice politics. I think she's being demure um, she's done and continues to do Trojan work in, in terms of her acti activism in that area and we're all very grateful for that. So Sinead, 20 minutes. Okay, thanks very much Natalie and I'd like to add my thanks to the ICCL um, for organising what I think has been a really fantastic and really interesting uh, day. Um, I should start by saying um, I am not a lawyer. I have um, no legal training whatsoever. So when I'm going to comment a little bit on law, um, so I just want to sort of emphasize that I am doing it um, as an outsider. And I'm sure that there may be lots of uh, flaws, perhaps, uh, as many of you are lawyers and, and legal scholars um, in, um, in, in perhaps the technicality of what I'm saying. But I suppose as someone um, who works in an English department, I'm, I'm interested in narrative and I'm interested in language and I'm interested in how language is used to put together um, a, a narrative and a story. And um, <laughs> what I want to talk about today is the voice um, of women in abortion campaigns. And um, um, Louisa set it up very nicely for me uh, by talking about how we need to put uh, women um, back into the frame when we, talk, uh, when we talk about abortion. And I think particularly when we look at the case of Ireland, part of the problem um, around um, uh, ab the, the issue of abortion in Ireland is that for, uh, I think, for much of its history since the Eighth Amendment was inserted into the Irish Constitution in 1983, the voices of women have been largely absent. And I think one of the reasons why uh, we are, um, in my more optimistic days, I like to think of um, as on the cusp of repealing the Eighth Amendment, although some days I'm not quite so sure. Um, if I look at what's going on, when I hear Ronan Mullen's comments today on the, at the Eighth Committee, I, I do begin to despair. But let's, uh, let's maybe take the more optimistic narrative um, um, for this afternoon. Um, I think it is, it is the voices of women that have begun to be... Um, reinserted. They have women, I think, have inserted themselves in many ways into the debate and that that um, has, has been, I would argue, one of the, if not the key, uh, uh, key uh, thing that has shifted forward, uh, forward the debate. And that's a little bit about what I want to, what I want to talk about today. 
So you've got the Eighth Amendment, that's just to say this is when we, uh, a lot of people, uh, we throw around the term Eighth Amendment, um, Article 43.3 of the Irish Constitution. And opinion polls actually do show that a lot of people actually don't know what the Eighth Amendment is. So um, anytime I talk about it, I do think it's important um, to, to say what it is. It is uh, 43 words inserted by a two-thirds majority into the Constitution in, um, in 1983 following a bitterly divisive uh, referendum uh, campaign that was described at the time by the Irish Times um, in a historical reference to Ireland's, uh, the partitioning of Ireland North and South as the second partitioning of Ireland. So divisive was, uh, was the debate at the time. And it says, the state acknowledges the right to life of the unborn and with due regard to the equal right to life of the mother, guarantees in its laws to respect and as far as practicable by its laws to defend and vindicate that right. Um, you'll notice, as Fiona's already pointed out um, uh, this morning, um, the use of the word mother. And I'll talk in a few minutes, this is not unique in the Irish constitution. The word mother and woman is used interchangeably in the, uh, in the Irish constitution. It is, as Professor Ivana Batchik has written, a uniquely misogynistic article in that it expressly sets up the right to life of both the pregnant woman and the fetus that she carries in conflict, anticipating that a time would come when someone would have to decide between them. And that is effectively what, uh, what happened nine years later um, in the infamous X case involving a 14-year-old rape victim who attempted to travel abroad to access uh, an abortion um, in England. Um, following a high court decision and then a Supreme Court decision, it was later decided that she was entitled to an abortion, but only because her life was at risk. Um, the, um, in, it, it, it emerged that so traumatised was she by what had happened to her, uh, not least the role that the Irish state had played in that, um, that she became suicidal. Um, and it was only because she was suicidal it was, in, uh, it was interpreted by the, uh, the Supreme Court that she had the right uh, to, uh, to an abortion. And I think until nine years later, until that 1992 X case, for the most part, the debate in Ireland had largely been um, uh, around uh, abortion. Um, as, as, uh, as was pointed out this morning, the word abortion wasn't even really used. Um, the, the, uh, in 1982, 1983, the term that was used was the substantive issue. That's what everybody talked about um, as abortion. Nobody ever really talked about abortion. The word was never really used. Um, and it didn't really, I think, kind of feature uh, for, uh, for a lot of us. Uh, I mean, I grew up in, in the 80s in the aftermath of that. And I was just talking to some friends of mine recently. And I think the first time I actually really thought about abortion uh, was when I saw the film Dirty Dancing. I don't know if anyone saw that, but <laughs> um, that I think for many people of my generation, it was the first time that we really talked, thought about abortion. Again, the word abortion is never really used in this film, but we all know something's happened. We think she's pregnant and she doesn't want to be. Um, and this is kind of how the story unfolds. But nobody ever really thought that that was the same thing as what was going on in terms of, of, of the 83 amendments. So it was always sort of um, classed um, behind this kind of veil of secrecy. Um, and along with the secrecy, of course, was the idea of shame, that it was never something that you could speak out loud. Um, two very brave women in the debate in 82-83, um, in um, uh, the campaigner um, Ruth Riddick and the journalist Mary Holland did come forward and talk about, uh, talk about their own abortions. But they did so in very, very hostile circumstances. Um, uh, M Mary Holland in particular uh, was routinely denounced around the country uh, by both uh, priests and politicians. And um, uh, somebody told me recently that she was speaking um, in Liberty Hall in Dublin, which is a, was a, is a union hall in Dublin, about um, as part of the anti-amendment campaign opposing the Eighth Amendment. And she had to leave early um, to go to her daughter's birthday party. And the um, anti-abortion 
activists in the room started screaming at her, what about the birthday of the child you aborted? And this was what followed Mary Holland around for decades. And uh, needless to say, um, in, in the sort of, the sort of um, hatred and vitriolic uh, kind of um, tone of the debate, that nobody talked about abortion, nobody talked about their, about their experience. That, however, I think did change um, in, um, uh, in 1992 uh, with, uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, uh, the X case. It wasn't that we didn't know the names of some women, we did, mainly um, I think there are some women that have, have kind of punctuated the debate in Ireland around abortion. Sheila Hodgers died very shortly before the Eighth Amendment um, was introduced into Ireland. She was uh, pregnant and refused cancer treatment. And she died six months before the Eighth Amendment was introduced. Um, she was pregnant, she died, and her baby died. Um, Michelle Hart um, died in 2010, um, again being pregnant and refusing and being refused um, uh, cancer treatment. We know this, we know Sheila's story because her husband um, spoke out, actually spoke out in the context of the, um, the referendum campaign back in 1983, but um, uh, Sheila's story was ignored. Michelle Hart did again very bravely speak out just before she died and, and her story was there, but never, never really kind of, uh, I think it was always kind of really kind of pushed to the margins. And it was thought, well, you can always go to, go to England if the, if the situation ar arose. And then very tragically, five years ago, the story of Savita Halapanavar um, came to the fore. And I think it, for many people, that really is what, is what kind of changed, uh, changed the story. Following Savita Halapanavar, I think many women did begin to speak out. First of all, a very uh, brave group um, of women um, associated uh, with a, a campaign called Termination for Medical Reasons, which are um, the pa uh, parents who have um, experienced um, a, a, ch a, a child, a pregnancy with, uh, with fatal, uh, fetal abnormalities. Women like Jeannie MacDonald, Ruth Bowie, Amanda Mellet, and Arlette Lines publish their stories and their photographs um, in the Irish Times, which is the Irish paper, uh, paper of record. We had the various court cases, often um, involving anonymous women, Miss X, Miss C, Miss D. But nevertheless, I think their stories did begin to um, enter into, uh, into the public realm. The importance um, of these interventions made by and on behalf of, of, of the named women, um, I, I don't think can be understated. They are, as a legal scholar, Mairead Enright wrote, in a particularly powerful intervention in 2011, they are the abortion debates Antigones. They have consecrated to Irish law, not a politics of victimhood, but a difficult, resistant politics of pain, death and grief. They have done it not as their anonymized counterparts did by going to the law. That's not to say that litigation um, has not played an important role in, um, in the struggle for abortion rights in Ireland. It has. But I think these women in particular who've come forward have done so by insisting on their entitlements, um, by speaking a language of state responsibility and of citizenship. And I think um, more recently, again, we have, um, we have a group of, uh, a third group of women who have come forward, who had their abortions for social, economic, or ethical reasons. And they have come forward. Pr uh, women, prominent women in public life, like Tara Fr Flynn, the comedian and actress, uh, the journalist Roisin Ingle, who have told their stories. And what is, I think, important about their stories is that when often we've heard stories of women um, in the Irish abortion debate, they were often kind of women who had been raped, women who were vulnerable in some way, um, children, uh, um, young, uh, young girls in care, um, 
uh, women who were um, uh, in need of abortion for medical reasons. And what was notable, I think, about particularly about Tara Flynn and Roisin Ingle was that they came out um, and decided uh, and, and made an uh, and made a case for simply having bodily autonomy, having control over their own lives. They were pregnant and they didn't want to be. Um, and they talked about the hurt um, and the shame that not that they that they felt was imposed upon them by the Irish state, by the fact that they were not cared for in their own country, that they were forced into exile, that they were fo forced to, to go abroad as if they were criminals. But in a sense, they were criminals in their own country because the law in Ireland criminalizes women who have abortions. And that also adds to the, se to the secrecy, but I think pr uh, uh, most acutely uh, to the shame and to the stigma that goes, uh, that goes along with that. There have also been other projects. Um, there's a, a current uh, photography project <coughs> called the Exile uh, Project that is photographing um, uh, women are coming forward, um, telling their stories and having their photographs um, uh, published on a, a, on a website. The abortion rights campaign's submission to the Citizens' Assembly collected the stories of more than 60 uh, women who have had, had abortions and submitted that to the, uh, to the Citizens' Assembly. And I think in doing so, they've kind of challenged the good abortion, bad abortion dichotomy um, that we often risk entering into um, uh, when, uh, when women talk about their abortions because, I think, of the kind of the stigma um, uh, that, that surrounds abortion. And I think they force us to move from this idea of, of sympathy and empathy to a more dangerous terrain for women, and that is that of identification. Um, we did it, I did it, standing up um, and owning their decision not apologizing for it. And I think that has been incredibly powerful um, in, the, uh, in the Irish debate. And I just want to just um, finish uh, just by talking um, about that idea of women standing up, speaking out and owning their decision. Because, um, and it's, I think it's interesting to think about that uh, in terms of the current climate at the moment. So we've all heard uh, the stories and the allegations around Harvey Weinstein, um, Kevin Spacey here in Ireland, um, um, the, uh, around the figure of Michael Colgan. And we've seen a number of women come out and tell, uh, and, and tell their stories. And, to do, uh, and, and many of them, I think, have done it at, enormously, uh, at enormous personal cost. Um, one of the things that kind of emerges or has a, is, is beginning to emerge is also the idea that uh, it's quite clear that none of this is really surprising. I mean, the most surprising thing to a lot of people is that it's, it's kind of taken so long for these stories to come out. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is that when women speak, and when women speak in public, there is the whole issue about credibility. Pauline Conroy said to me this morning that she's, she's, done, the, she's done the math, and effectively, um, it is uh, for, um, the, the, sort of the ratio to sort of authority when it comes to speaking is, for every, is eight women for every one man. So before anyone believes uh, one woman, um, a another seven women have to speak out. Somebody, I think, there was a column in The Guardian that recently said, if only one woman had spoken out against Harvey Weinstein, would we be in the situation, uh, would he be in the situation he is now? Probably not. So that when women speak, they, ha um, they, they risk, um, uh, they're not seen to have credibility, and they risk their own credibility. So women speaking in public always entails a risk. It is never simply a neutral act. And I, I referred um, earlier to uh, using uh, Mairead Enright's uh, phrase about the our Irish Antigones. And um, a lot of the time, the figure of Antigone is seen as, as someone to kind of embody the kind of uh, liberal individual subject um, speaking out against the authority of the state. And it's often been invoked in kind of philosophical, political and legal discourse. Um, she is seen to embody that figure. 
But I think there is another reading of it that particularly the kind of feminist legal scholars have looked at that sees um, that Antigone is not just an individual liberal subject. She is also a woman. And the question of her gender and her ability to speak is important. Because in the, um, what, um, what Antigone's real act of transgression, if you remember in, in, in Sophocles' play, is not just that she buried her brother, but that she, through an act of speech, owns, she's given the opportunity to deny her actions at various points, but she refuses to deny her actions. And through an act of speech, she owns her act. Um, and that, in, in many ways, embodies, the de- it is a speech act that embodies um, her defiance against the state, against, uh, against Creon. And I think when women choose to speak, um, I think there are all sorts of kind of questions and negotiations that are involved in those, uh, in those acts of speech. Because first of all, the public realm is traditionally and largely seen to be the realm of men. And when women enter into that realm, they are supposed to um, adopt the language, the performative language of politics, of the law, and to speak not as themselves. Because when they speak of themselves, when they speak of their pain and their hurt, of the things that are done to them by the state, um, that, that they are seen to lack um, credibility. We rarely listen to them. And when we begin to, I think, even complicate that further, um, the question of gender is certainly um, important in relation to speaking. But so too is the question of race. And so too is the question of class. Because when we listen to women, even the sort of ideal uh, female subject is still white and middle class and Western. Uh, and there's a whole bo- uh, that that it, that excludes a whole um, a, ho- a, a whole section of other women, women of colour, uh, working class women, poor women, marginalised women. And we have seen in Ireland um, in the um, in the abortion debate that we have seen women um, who um, the women who often end up in the Irish courts are the women who very often have literally have no voice. They are children. They're minors. They're in the care of the state. They don't even have any parents to advocate for them. We've seen the case of Miss Y, who was literally a woman who had um, she did not have uh, the language. Um, She came here as an asylum seeker and did not have the language to speak. So finally, um, I know in terms of the campaign to repeal the Eighth Amendment, we've been thinking a lot about things that we might say or slogans. And a lot of time, I think, as advocates, we say things like trust women. And I think that's a a very good place to begin. But it's also one inherent with a lot of, uh, in which there's a lot of danger. Because um, we also know that lots of people don't trust women. So I suppose the the kind of challenge is to how do we negotiate that, allow women's voices um, into a public realm in which women's voices are rarely actually respected. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Sinead, not least for managing to uh, work in both Antigone and Dirty Dancing into a presentation on uh, (laughs) abortion. (laughs) The amount of skill that takes should not be underestimated. Thank you very much. That's not to undermine your uh, contribution, Sinead. Thank you. Um, Next, we're going to hear from Les Alambi. Um, And Les is the Chief Commissioner of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission um, since 2014. Um, And the Commission is, as you might know, um, at the moment challenging the law on abortion in Northern Ireland um, and on human rights grounds, and that's specifically in respect of the lack of access in cases of fatal fetal anomaly um, or abnormality. And prior to that, um, Les was in Dirty Dancing, no. um, (laughs) He was the director of the Law Centre. I'm going to let that one go now. Um, He was the director of the Law Centre, which was a legal NGO working in the fields of social security, mental health, asylum and uh, employment. Um, And he's also a former chair of the Committee for the Administration of Justice. So you also have 20 minutes. 
And sorry for the dirty dancing joke. No, no. Well, it's funny you should say that. Now I'll come to it in a second because um, <clears throat> you've got a thumbnail sketch of how human rights is a contested space in Northern Ireland this morning from uh, Claire Johnson. Um, and uh, not just in terms of issues of abortion, LGBTI rights, the rights of same-sex couples, and dealing with the past in um, a post-conflict society. One of the virtues of being the Chief Commissioner of the uh, Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission is you get called a few things. Um, um, and recently I was on a live TV debate around the issue of uh, abortion. And I was accused of being a sexual revolutionary, not quite <laughs> dirty dancing, but I, I <laughs> so I stand before you as a sexual revolutionary. Um, and I <laughs> should say it came as news to me, um, my family, most of my friends, <laughs> and certainly my colleagues as well. Um, so uh, this is a journey into uh, sexual uh, revolution without the dirty dancing. But what I want to do is say something about the case that we've been involved in um, and some of the experience and learning um, from that case. Um, the law in Northern Ireland, as you heard this morning, um, has the same effective underpinnings as the law in the rest of Ireland, but effectively without the constitutional overlay. So our legislation is 19th century. It criminalizes um, women who procure um, their own miscarriages, you're guilty of a criminal offence, you face up to life imprisonment. Anyone who supports a woman to procure a miscarriage is also guilty of a criminal offence and is liable up to five years in prison. We have child destruction legislation, slightly more contemporary but still um, now uh, over 70 years old, which creates the criminal offence of child destruction with punishment of up to life imprisonment, again unless uh, the act is done in good faith for the purpose only of preventing uh, or preserving uh, the life of the mother. So as we heard this morning in El Salvador, the issue is not just criminalization, but the severity of the sentence, the potential severity of the sentence that goes um, with that. We also have common law. The UK has a common law tradition, judge-made law. Um, and um, a termination... Uh, is lawful in Northern Ireland, based again on judge-made law and judgments, where again it would preserve the life of the mother, or the continuation of the pregnancy would make a woman a physical or mental wreck, whatever a physical or mental wreck is, is in practice. And secondly, a more contemporary case which says the continuation of the pregnancy would have caused a risk again to the life of the mother, or would have caused serious and long-term harm to her physical and mental health uh, and that's a case called the Flat Family Planning Association of Northern Ireland versus the Minister of Health and Social Services and Public Safety. Now, in essence, our law, and it was mentioned um, in, in the, um, earlier by both of our earlier speakers, access to termination in Northern Ireland is lawful, but a woman has to demonstrate effectively her dependence. Um, she can't get or seek a termination based on her autonomy as a free-thinking individual. She has to be a physical or mental wreck. Her life has to be um, at risk. There must be serious long-term damage to her physical or mental health, none of which is about um, her autonomy. Um, and we've heard a number of examples today about the kind of war of attrition that has gone on uh, between those uh, characterized as, as pro-life and those characterized as, as pro-choice. Northern Ireland is no different. The publication of even guidance to try and allow clinicians to make decisions on this issue has been legally disputed in a number of court cases that have taken almost 10 years. Finally, the Department of Health issued guidance in Northern Ireland in March 2016. Um, and the guidance is as clear as mud. And I quote, it's for a medical practitioner to assess on a case-by-case -case basis, using their professional judgment as to whether the individual woman's clinical circumstances meet the grounds for a termination of pregnancy in Northern Ireland. So it's, it's a clinical choice. Health and social care professionals must balance the need for confidentiality of patients with the obligation to report unlawful terminations of pregnancy to the police and the need to protect others from the risk 
of serious harm. So both of those are left to clinical judgment. We have other criminal law that says if you don't report a criminal offence, then that itself uh, is an offence punishable again by a significant term of imprisonment. So of course the reality is that lack of clarity, that leaving it to individual judgment in the context where you could face life imprisonment for failing to make the right particular judgment means it's much easier to export the problem to Britain than it is to make a decision locally. And Claire mentioned that there were 16 um, terminations in Northern Ireland in 2015-16. There are something like seven to 800 women a year who travel across uh, to Britain um, to seek uh, an abortion and until recently to, to pay for that. And it very much is a class issue um, uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, the FPA used to estimate that that was an underestimate. It used to be something like two, somewhere nearer 2,000 women a year. The um, position has changed somewhat by the access to uh, pills through Women on the Web and other organisations. Women on the Web have published uh, data that suggests that um, three times the, uh, the number of women are now seeking advice through their services in Northern Ireland than did six years ago. So uh, how people deal with the issue has changed the kind of numbers that are dealing with the issue are very significant in the context of a small, uh, a small island, um, or a small part, rather, of, of an island. The second thing I want to look at, and, and it came up this morning in, in an interesting debate about, well, how valuable or otherwise are treaty monitoring bodies? I have to say from a position of somebody who heads uh, a national human rights institution, they are actually very significant. We couldn't have taken the case that we took without the international standards and without the comments from um, committees on the, U the UK's um, treaty uh, monitoring and the, the things that the UK have signed up to. So the CEDAW committee, for example, has said the United Kingdom should ex expedite the amendment of anti-abortion law in Northern Ireland with a view to decriminalizing abortion in 2013. The Aseska Committee in 2016 said the committee is concerned that termination of pregnancy is still criminalised in all circumstances except where the life of the woman is in danger, which could lead to unsafe abortions and disproportionately affect women from low-income families who cannot travel to the other parts of the United Kingdom. The CRC Committee has said that uh, we should decriminalise abortion in Northern Ireland in all circumstances, review its legislation, with a view to ensuring girls' access to safe abortion and post-abortion care services, and the views of the child should always be heard and respected in abortion decisions. The ICCPR committee have said the state party should, as a matter of priority, amend its legislation on abortion in Northern Ireland, with a view to providing for additional exceptions to the legal ban on abortion, including in cases of rape, incest, and fatal fetal abnormality, and the state party should also ensure access to information on abortion, contraception, and sexual and reproductive health. Um, more recently, and clearly more contentiously, and I will come back to this, the UNCRPD committee said, the committee is concerned about perceptions in society stigmatizing persons with disabilities, living a life of less value, and the termination of pregnancy at any stage on the basis of fetal impairment. The committee recommends that the state party changes abortion law accordingly. Women's rights to reproductive and sexual autonomy should be respected without legalizing selective abortions on grounds of fetus deficiency. I have to say that proved extremely unhelpful to us. It muddied the waters in the case uh, that I'm about to describe, and it was seized on by the Attorney General for Northern Ireland, who opposed the Commission's case vehemently um, throughout the process. It was also used because UNCRPD is uh, a treaty that's been incorporated through membership of the European Union, and therefore the argument was that the CRPD committee's comments had greater weight than any of the other treaty comments. Um, it was asked this morning where the UNCRPD committee was coming from. I'm almost certain, because having looked at some of the other work that they've done in other issues, and having looked at the rest of the report, which was very positive about issues of, of disability and disability rights and non-discrimination, they start, and perhaps unfortunately end at one level, from the idea that uh, equality 
um, is the only game in town, and therefore that, that's the issue. So we need to have a debate about the nuances of, um, of these issues, because effectively, I suspect that was a comment about the UK's laws, not about the law in Northern Ireland, but it had an impact that clearly wasn't intended, and therefore there is a need on the international stage to have a discussion with the CRPD committee about the importance of non-discrimination against some of the realities of what they say and how that will be used in practice. Uh, you, you were given two examples um, this morning about how this is still a very real issue in Northern Ireland. Uh, in 2016, a woman who aborted her fetus at home was reported to the police by a flatmate, was prosecuted and received a three-month prison sentence that was suspended for two years. Uh, currently, a mother who obtained abortion pills for her 15-year-old pregnant daughter was reported to the police by her doctor. Again, if you go back to the guidelines, the, um, the issue again of, of medical confidentiality, which is part of this case, she's being prosecuted, and that decision to prosecute is being challenged uh, legally. The commission um, has put in its own written legal submission to support the applicant, and that case has been adjourned pending our own um, Supreme Court case. So what's our, um, our own um, commission legal challenge? Well, very briefly, the Commission's challenge is the failure to provide access to terminations in cases of fatal fetal abnormality, serious malformation of the fetus, and for victims of sex crimes is contrary to the European Convention of Human Rights. From the Commission's point of view, we have to base the challenge on what the international standards say and what uh, UN treaty uh, bodies have said in terms of uh, general comments and concluding observations. Article 3 is freedom from torture, inhuman and degrading treatment. Uh, Article 8 is the right to private and family life, which is a qualified right. It's not an absolute right. And Article 14 is freedom from discrimination, which has to be read with Article 8. The challenge also encompassed the, the common law position on the right to the life of the woman and the fetus. And I'll say something about what the High Court had to say, because it's particularly interesting in terms of... Um, the constitutional position in the rest of Ireland, and also our legal standing to take a case without a victim. So did we have the power to take this case uh, in the first place? We won in the High Court based on Article 8 only. Uh, the challenge failed on the grounds of Article 3 uh, and Article 14. It was held we didn't meet the threshold of, of inhuman and degrading treatment. Um, the Commission's uh, standing to take the case was upheld. And the common law right of um, the question of the common law right of the fetus was um, addressed as well. And what the High Court said was, uh, while the fetus has some statutory protections, uh, the fetus has no freestanding right. Any right that the fetus has is inextricably linked to the right of the woman. Um, and that is uh, the common law position in the rest of the UK. And what the High Court said is that common law position is no different uh, in Northern Ireland. Now, that was um, not disturbed by the Court of Appeal. Um, whether the Supreme Court will say anything on that issue remains to be seen. All of the issues were appealed either by ourselves or by the Attorney General and the Department of Justice to um, the Court of Appeal. We lost at the Court of Appeal. Article 8 was said to be engaged, the right to family uh, and private life. So the issue of, of a woman's right to personal and, and bodily autonomy was engaged. But as a qualified right, in a set of very conservative judgments, the uh, three judges, for, for a variety of different reasons, felt that this matter should be left to the Northern Ireland um, Assembly. We appealed to the Supreme Court. The case was heard two weeks ago, over three days. There were a large number of interveners. In fact, the greatest number of people intervened um, ever in, in a case before either the Supreme Court or its predecessor, the House of Lords. And I want to pay tribute to a number of those people who intervened because their, their organizations are here today. They were extremely valuable and useful um, to us. Um, so the Center for Reproductive Rights, the United Nations Working Group on the Issue of Discrimination Against Women in Law and Practice, put in written and in some cases oral submissions. There was a cast of thousands, the Humanists UK, uh, JR76, the, the legal representatives of the, the mother being prosecuted, Sarah Ewart, we've heard about a number of brave women 
uh, elsewhere in Ireland, a very brave woman who suffered a fatal fetal abnormality and then went very public when she discovered she had to travel uh, to Britain for an abortion. Amnesty International, um, Christian Action and Research and Education, ADF International UK, Patricia, Professor Patricia Carey, uh, uh, a clinician based here in Dublin, uh, the Family Planning Association, British Pregnancy Advisory Service, Abortion Support Network, Birth Rights in the Royal College of Midwives, the Bishops of the Roman Catholic Diocese in Northern Ireland, uh, the Society for the Protection of the, for, of the Unborn Child, and finally, Equality and Human Rights Commission, but on the question of standing only. Now, judgment in this case is reserved and is being awaited. Um, candidly, the only thing I can tell you is I'm convinced it will not be either 7-0 either in our favour or 7-0 against us. I'm almost certain that there will be a divided Supreme Court on the issue. Um, I hope in some ways for my commission's sake that uh, we win, because if not, a pobrium will come uh, be heaped on from on high politically on, on the commission. But that's effectively, and being sanguine about this, we went into this, this case with our eyes open. So what is the learning for this in terms of, of some of the wonderful work being done elsewhere? First, I think it's the kind of work that a national human rights institution should do. Um, under UN Paris principles, national human rights institutions have to recognize the need for pluralism. And from my own experience as the chief commissioner, it's what I call the art of the possible. Um, and I have a re resolutely, in my previous commission, because we've just changed uh, our commission almost entirely apart from me, um, are, how, were resolutely pluralist on a number of issues. But we started from the position of this is a human rights issue. So we didn't have a debate about whether people were pro-choice or pro-life or somewhere in between on that continuum. We started and we remain with the position that this is a human rights issue. What does human rights standards say? And that's the basis on which we take the case. International treaty monitoring work is really vital and important to us. And therefore, the work that's been done elsewhere and the influences that people have brought to bear from NGO communities, etc., has been really useful and vital to us. Um, the legal action provided a fillip for a wider public debate and reform in Northern Ireland. Um, I don't apologize for that. It's not the basis we took it. It was a human rights uh, issue, but we knew that it would stimulate um, what's all, what was already out there. And frankly, at each stage of the court case, it's yet again thrown uh, the issue into, into sharp relief. And it's meant a number of things have happened that I think the Commission is frankly only one part of a much wider, bit, uh, wider picture. There was an expectation that we were going to win the case at the Court of Appeal. The Department of Justice thought um, we were going to win. And it's no coincidence that on the day of the judgment was the day that uh, the Parliament in Westminster announced that uh, for the first time uh, women in uh, travelling from Northern Ireland to Britain would be able to ha access treatment for free instead of paying for that treatment. The day before the Supreme Court case, the guidelines about how that would happen in practice again were, were published. They were more liberal than people expected. It allowed on a means-tested basis uh, women to have both free accommodation and free travel if they met certain um, economic circumstances. So low-income women, that became uh, an issue, uh, the, the kind of the news story. So somewhere in the Department of Equalities in Britain, the news management team is looking at our case very carefully. These things don't happen uh, as a coincidence. Um, the other thing then, I think, is what's happened in, in, in Northern Ireland. We've had um, uh, attempts to amend the uh, Justice Bill without success in the Assembly. Um, the issue was attempted to be kicked into touch by setting up a, a working group to look at fatal fetal uh, abnormality only. It was revealed during the, uh, the Supreme Court case that that group of, of individuals who've never published the report, it's with the Minister of Health and the Minister for Justice, and the Assembly has fallen, but it was revealed partly to bolster the argument that this, there was something happening in Northern Ireland that the um, recommendation is for some reform in fatal fetal abnormality. Um, you have to prepare yourself for a backlash. Um, uh, we have a Freedom of Information Act. Everything I've committed uh, ever in an email or anything else on abortion has been sought. 
as luck would have it, I am a fairly uh, temperate individual. I have what's called the pause principle. Uh, I reply to everybody's emails that come into me, positive or otherwise, but I always do it having drawn breath before I do so. So that's proven to be um, not great for those who wanted to see something intemperate said by me uh, uh, publicly. Um, but, and I, I think this is kind of interesting, we have tried, um, and I'll um, to also uh, open some channels of communication. We've had um, uh, protests outside of our building. Uh, we had the Evangelical Alliance holding a prayer vigil one night on a very cold winter's evening a year ago. We invited them in to the building. We said, if you want to have your prayer vigil in the warm rather than the cold, um, and we'll give you tea and coffee, and we will discuss what your work is and entails, and we'll tell you about ours. Now, you might feel uh, whether that's a good or a bad thing. I take the view, in a much wider context of Northern Ireland, I will go and talk to anybody about human rights issues wherever they come from. I take the view, in a Northern Irish context, there's little point in just talking to people who agree with you. You have to talk to people who don't. And you have to start from where people are and try and draw them across. I'm not going to try and pretend I've persuaded, frankly, on many of the issues, whether it's talking to uh, loyalist paramilitaries through to talking to uh, pro-life organisations, that much has changed as a result of those conversations. But I hope that um, some seeds will have been left by way of a legacy for those who come after me um, as um, a chief, uh, chief commissioner. So, um, finally, I think in terms of, of learning... I've been involved in strategic litigation as part of a much wider set of issues uh, all of my working life. Um, you never put all your eggs in one basket, and strategic litigation is just one way of um, dealing with issues. And so the multifaceted kind of work that had been done by people in this room, whether you come at this from a lawyer, whether you come at this from uh, the position of an activist or some other position, um, all of that work is really important. Um, and when we look at where public opinion has moved in Northern Ireland, at least in terms of the, of the issues um, uh, in our case, uh, the pace of change may seem glacial, um, but it is actually changing in a positive direction. And a recent Life and Times survey showed that 81% uh, uh, of the population agreed that abortion should be uh, legally available in cases of, of rape and incest, and three quarters agreed in cases of fatal fetal abnormality and serious malformation of the fetus. So to end on a positive note, public debate is moving slowly but surely in a more positive direction in Northern Ireland. Um, and I think that much of the work that's been done by people in this room has helped to create that climate to move people into uh, a much more positive space on social, liberal and moral issues in Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thanks, Les. Um, we have a period of about 15 minutes during which we can take questions. So if you have questions, now would be the time to raise your hands for any of our speakers. And I think, Francis, also, you're going to partake, perhaps. Right. Thank you. Yeah, there's one just at the back here. Thanks. Yeah, hi. Um, I. I'm Irish Indian. I have just finished a PhD on rights uh, in UCC. I've been living here 10 years. I wanted, um, and thank you for all the, I mean, I've been hearing since morning, and I'm very grateful to be here today. And I thought I'd been in the wrong women's rights organizations before here. Uh, what, what I am coming for, I, I had an abortion uh, two years back, uh, two and a half, three years back. I had to cross the, See, I, had, I went to Liverpool. The element, you know, Sinead, you were talking about a few things. The one thing that was absent probably was the element of surprise for somebody like me who comes from India where abortion is legal. And I, it, it, for me to realize that, oh shit, I can't, you know? And I could not speak, I could not talk to the GP or I go anywhere. So in the seventh week when I found out I was pregnant, I, waited for a couple of more weeks to think about it because you know I have a family, I have a 20-year-old daughter and a 13-year-old son. 
and um, a husband who's very supportive. But I, we were still thinking, should we, should we not, what? And in the meantime, you know, it was 10 weeks or 11 weeks, I don't remember. So I did go to Liverpool. And uh, to my surprise, I found that um, I was carrying a dead fetus with a growing sac. So I was pregnant by all means, by technical means. So I was throwing up. I had everything. But I would have probably ended up with septicemes, yeah, what Savita did end up with. So the doctors in Liverpool were fantastic. They gave me all you know care and everything. But sometimes I was totally, I was traumatized by that whole thing, that I could not go over here. So um, the way I deal, I don't have a problem sharing things. You know, I speak in a lot of conferences. Anyway, I write poetry. It's in my poetry. Um, the problem was not that um, it was traumatizing for me, not uh, the, the element of decision that I could not take a decision for myself. Uh, and I was not in a space where it was safe. Um, all of that was surprising as well as um, it, it I, I don't know how to describe it, because in 1997, uh, I had one uh, abortion in India, and I didn't think about it a second time. But here, it was uh, quite a challenge, and uh, which is why I don't mind speaking about it. I don't know the law very well still, but you know the, the whole thing about agency is so much more important. So I, this is the first time I really th heard something which was very, uh, but I, you know the way I think, there are other people who think like that. Thanks for that. I don't know if anybody wants to respond to that on the panel. Firstly, thank you very much for your intervention. Yes, thank you. Um, that's the first thing I would say. Um, you've described uh, it as a challenge, and I think that's a, a, an underestimation. Um, so, but certainly what you're saying does speak to a lot of what the speakers have been talking about today in terms of restrictions, in terms of the creeping nature of those restrictions. I mean, we're in a situation where we don't even have the legal rights that have been established elsewhere, as you've just demonstrated. Um, but all of these issues around agency and the, the kinds of issues we've been addressing today, um, I think are absolutely crucial and I think it is really good that we have this forum to discuss them in but I don't know if anybody wants to say something more yeah well, in particular I, about I, that. I, want to, I mean firstly this panel was fascinating um, and I wanted to thank the organizers um, enormously for um, ha having me participate here um, and it's it, it, it's inspiring to hear the different people who are involved um, from different regions and countries and in Ireland um, there are two things I'd like to say. Firstly, I think it's come out really rather cl very clearly from almost all participants. Women's agency is what needs to be re-emphasized. And the exceptional case exceptions are not enough. They're not nearly enough. In fact, I think that they're doing us harm. They're doing harm to the central importance of women's agency because they're not to do with women's agency. They are impossible to apply. They're causing not only delays, but in many cases, it's an illusion. How many women find it easy to prove rape? <laughs> I mean, rape is one of, it's the most unreported crime there is. Um, the fatal impairment, we've heard how impossible it is, and looked at the tragic cases where doctors have refused to say there's a fatal impairment and it's ruined women's lives. So I think that that should not be a distraction. And the only other thing I want to say, and I say it really, I mean, I'm surprised at myself as well, that there is an elephant in the room that's hardly been mentioned, and that is religion and the church and what you can expect. And there's going to be a referendum, and don't underestimate the church in Eastern Europe and in Latin America and in Russia. And not only the church, I mean in Muslim countries where one would not have expected this approach because there is not such a rigid, rigid um, doctrinaire and dog, dog, approach of dogma to uh, abortion um, under Islam, you're finding some of the same phenomena. So I, I, I think that that is something that we have to think about. And I would say that the weaknesses, the contradictions in the position taken by the church should be exposed. And one of the ways of doing it is showing that the church has been soundly, very strongly opposed 
to contraception, not only to abortion. And that makes one ask exactly what is the church opposing or protecting? Is it really the life of the unborn even before there has been conception? in contraception, and I think also point out that the church is supposed to be um, a, um, a haven for the poor, and the church is targeting poor women in its doctrine on uh, preventing um, access to abortion. So I, I, think, I think it has to be very carefully worded and formulated so as not to uh, alienate some of the population that maybe you have to handle it more carefully, but I, I think that it is an elephant in the room that we've almost ignored um, in our discussions. Um, yeah, well, I just want to say thank you for, for your contribution and for, for telling your story, because I, I, I think that's, um, that's it's an important thing to do, but it's not always a, an easy thing to do, so, so thank you. And your point about surprise, I think, is, um, is, is very well made, and I think that kind of feeds into um, another way in which women's autonomy is, is denied. They're denied information. They're de de denied knowledge. Knowledge about the law, knowledge about their own bodies. Um, and, and, and knowledge, I think, is very important in terms of um, you know, uh, how we become autonomous individuals, how we make those decisions. Because in order to make the right decision, we need, uh, we need the knowledge to do that. And, um, you know, that there are all sorts of obstacles. Uh, you said that you're Indian Irish, that we, you know, part of the Ar our, our Irish law around abortion is that it, it assumes two things. It assumes, one, that you have the means to travel, but also it assumes that you simply have the ability to travel, that you have the visa, that you have the passport, that you can jump on the plane. And again, that is, I think, part of, um, you know, that idea of the kind of white liberal middle-class subject that you know that often when we do talk about women's experience is centered in the debate but it ignores the you know the, the difficulties and complications um, that women who do not fit into that very sort of neat uh, category experience and they uh, and that experience um, is 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 com you know whatever about the experience of women who have, have abortions that experience is very is, is kind of negated and is incredibly marginalized even within the kind of discussion. So, so thank you for your contribution. Does anyone else from the panel want to say I, anything? I just want to say very briefly, yeah. thank, thank you for your, what you had to say. One of the things I think I've garnered in the last few years is the culture of silence around the issue has been broken in both parts of Ireland. Um, that isn't to take away from the kind of work that's been done by activists, etc. But in the last two or three years, I'm struck by the number of women who've talked about their personal experiences or talked about, and in, at great risk sometimes to their professional lives, about what's going on in terms of this as a professional clinician in a way that you wouldn't have heard even five years ago um, women talking about, about this issue. And I think that's quite a significant change in certainly in Northern Ireland, about the culture of women not being silenced and going way beyond those who uh, deal with this as a political issue to those who are saying, this is my experience and I'm prepared to talk about it in a way that's very brave uh, and is very welcome. I think we have some more questions. There's one here and one here. Hi. Um, so I'm from a medical background and... I would, I suppose I'd view everything through a sort of, a, particularly abortion, through a medical lens. And we were, you know, again, just thinking about the campaign, about messaging, about information. And I think it's apparent, like, we were doing some research on the Citizens' Assembly of the submissions, excuse me, of Irish citizens um, on their thoughts on abortion, kind of more about their concerns that weren't directly addressed, like, so it would be things on sexual health, etc. And it became apparent in the course of this analysis of 74 responses that people weren't really using the language of human rights. And, you know, they were indirectly talking about it, women's, you know, women's choices and bodies and um, equal access. But people, I think, mm. don't really understand what a right is. I think it's something we hear all the time. But I wonder, is there a way, do you think, of communicating better to, say, the lay person mm. what a human right means, what it means when a UN committee 
makes a comment and uh, those impacts. Thank you. Just before I go to the panel, we might take the second question and deal with them both, perhaps. Um, hey, Eva. Thank you. My question sort of lines up with what you were talking about now in terms of language. Um, in South Africa, we have 11 official languages. And um, in most parts, you have uh, the law is explained in English because I'm, I'm assuming it's, it's easier to, to talk about it in English. So you find that in most situations, I'm Zulu. So when, when it is time to go out into communities and to talk to them about rights, about abortions, it becomes an extra layer or barrier to actually getting the information across because you still have to first translate what the law says in a language that someone will understand. So now when we're looking back again to women in rural areas, I know for instance that when I was taught in primary school, um, I was taught English in Zulu, if that even makes sense. So um, you are taught the English in, in your own language first before it actually becomes English. So in a situation like that where most people do not have the opportunity to get the basics of English, um, trying to explain what abortion is, what right is, what, mm. you know, um, finding some, for me it's easier because I know, I know the root words of those particular situations. So if I had to explain to a Zulu speaker what abortion is, I would try in some ways without using the, because the vernac sometimes is crude. For instance, abortion in Izulu is kipisis. So kipisis is literally removing the womb. So automatically, the minute you start talking about abortion to a Zulu person, you are saying, umuyohambio kipisis. Already, the connotation for that is, is something that people do not want to talk about. Mm. So I don't know whether it's a question or, or a comment, or I just don't know how then we move forward to say, in English, certain words, even though they have the stigma mm. of abortion, but the minute I take abortion to ukipisisu already, I've, I've, I've entered into another realm that I don't know how well to maneuver. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Just in respect to that first question, um, I don't know if anyone would like to start just in relation to how do we, how do we educate around rights or how do we communicate around that concept? <laughs> that, that it's one of the least talked about aspects of the international human mm. rights system. Mm. There is actually an obligation on states yeah. to educate to human rights. And uh, parental uh, preference, religious or cultural, cannot derogate from the minimal obligation of, state, of states to educate to human rights. And it's been in very neglected within the UN system and uh, by states. There are very few states that have this obligation in their, their syllabus. Spain had it, as a matter of fact, and then changed it and allowed parents to choose between constitutional ethics in the children's syllabus and religion. So they just moved back on it uh, a couple of years ago. So um, we, we critiqued that when we, we went on a country visit to Spain. So it's very important about language. We did talk about whether we should be using the word abortion or termination of pregnancy. And it might be that in some languages, one has to use alternative descriptions to make sure that this the correct message that's being uh, transferred. But it is part of human rights education, and we should be all fighting for a kit in languages um, with human rights and women's human rights. Just sorry, just to, to something that chimes with that, in fact, in an Irish context is that the uh, le current legislation providing for abortion in certain contexts uh, uses the phrase termination of pregnancy, but that has been interpreted in the guidelines as meaning um, post viability, as meaning delivery. So actually language is not just important in terms of, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm obviously addressing this from a legal perspective almost entirely. It has much wider um, implications, but certainly if you're a person seeking a termination under a termination of pregnancy under the uh, sorry an abortion under the act and you in fact are afforded the opportunity to have a termination of pregnancy and um, beyond a certain point it will actually under the irish guidelines result in a, a delivery can i um, make, a, can I make yeah. a quick point on the rights um discourse and a, a, a positive i suppose indication of northern ireland wider than um than issues of, of abortion but um there have been a number of 
funders um, through the Community Foundation for Northern Ireland who have offered grants to community organisations to do work around social justice and rights where they've encouraged um, and done some quite innovative work on reframing what are community-based issues through a rights-based mm -hmm. framework. The, we lack a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, it's part of the Belfast Agreement, but there was an enormous amount of work done by NGOs, by predecessor commission, to build up the idea of what a Bill of Rights might be and mm -hmm. look like. There is a much greater rights discourse in Northern Ireland. I don't always recognise it in terms of international standards and treaty monitoring about how rights are asserted. But I take it as a very positive change between when my working life started in the 1980s when a rights discourse was pretty much a cloistered discussion between lawyers and academics and now where there really is a rights-based discourse um, even if some of that rights-based discourse is pretty much of a false consciousness the yeah. fact that people talk about my rights mm. or our rights I think is actually a very positive issue. So there are ways in which through community-based kind of approaches, you can begin to get people framing what are their local issues or whatever they are, environmental issues, uh, issues of women's rights in a rights-based framework. It is possible to do that in the most difficult of circumstances. Louise, I think, sorry, I had interrupted oh, no, that's you. Fine. On, on the rights question, so I would say that we have two different ways of thinking about it. So one is, and this is based on you know, focus groups and communication studies, that when, if we bring a big case, our press release almost never, doesn't usually have a quotation that's about rights. It usually has a quotation that's about decency or fairness or something yeah. like that. And part of that is because, and again, this goes to um, certain almost like triggers that people sometimes if they mm -hmm. hear, well, this is a, fun, a violation of rights, it sounds con conclusive and it doesn't necessarily talk to how people talk, say, at a, at a dinner table or whatever. So fairness, more people will hear fairness than will always hear rights. So we have that frame. And then we also spend a lot of time with know your rights. <laughs> because it's also really important that when there's a right, like when the cops pull you over, that you know what you can say no to and that you know you can call a lawyer and what you can do and that you know that abortion is legal until this, this, this point. And that... Yeah. I, I, I hear what you're saying too, how important it is to have a discourse about rights and then also how important it is to try to move people to care about your issues when you're bringing, when you're trying to sort of open up spaces in certain sense. I, your comment about, um, Zula, I just want to say that's one of the critical reasons why it's so important that our coalitions and our work be diverse so that we can hear that people from communities are from all the different communities are reflected yeah. so that we actually bring the richness of the culture and figure out how we talk to different, how we, can, how we hear different people and how we effectively communicate. We have run out of time. Um, so I just want to say thank you very much to this panel um, for all of your contributions. Um, also, I suppose just to uh, add my voice to uh, thank the Irish Council for Civil Liberties, who, by the way, are on a daily level engaged in exactly that exercise of informing us all about our rights um, in a myriad of ways. So thank you to them. Um, and I don't know, Liam, if you want to say anything by way of finishing up. Or Great, Stefani will do that. Great, hi. So... Can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me. So I also want to thank all the wonderful speakers of today for this very rich conversation. Uh, I particularly enjoyed learning more about the uh, Irish campaign and the Northern Irish uh, developments that I knew very little about. Um, I am Mustafania Kaprontai and I'm the co-chair of the International Network of Civil Liberties Organizations, one of the co-organizers with ICCL of, of today's event. And um, INCLO uh, has 13 local NGOs who bring local experiences to the table. Uh, many of the speakers who you heard today represent one 
one of those organizations. Um, and we coordinate our strategies in order to influence the state of global human rights. And this is what we are, we were attempting to do today as well, to uh, bring these local experiences, to highlight the common themes and also strategize and think about uh, what, uh, what are the ways to advance uh, reproductive rights in this case. And we are also supporting our members uh, who are at the critical juncture and now this is the Irish uh, the Irish uh, community really with the repeal the eighth campaign not only the ICCL um, what we could see see really throughout the day as a recurring theme is that there's a general pushback to, to human rights and it affects the human rights institutions as well but also human rights defenders in a very profound way in their everyday work uh, we heard uh, reiterating the, those scientific arguments that we, I think, in the room are very familiar with, uh, that very much support our stance on sexual and reproductive rights and reproductive justice. Uh, we heard that despite those scientific arguments and despite that, uh, uh, that there are some very good legislations also uh, on a the paper, there is a backlash. And the backlash can uh, come in the face of legislation, but also in other ways and forms. And we also learned that le if there's a legislation, it is important, but uh, good law is uh, not the end of the story. We heard many stories about access, uh, problems with access, problems with access to information, both on the sides of the women, but both on the on the on the other side, on the side of the doctors that uh, impede women to access uh, well, uh, very much needed services. So we heard from South Africa that uh, oftentimes it's not even known where local facilities can be found in the country, and that uh, affects women's access to to much needed services. But we also heard from Colombia that doctors are. Um, are saying that they have very little knowledge about contraceptions. So how could they advise women about that? And we also heard uh, from, uh, from the US that there, there's an issue about accessing the facilities uh, themselves. And, um, and counseling, counseling being another ways of restricting women's access uh, to, to abortion services. Another important uh, team that I could uh, identify in today's discussion regards the abortion pill, the abortion medi medical abortion, uh, that really speaks to the question whether women's health and life is in the center of the debate or not. Because in, in many uh, jurisdictions we see that medical abortion is not available despite the very clear medical evidence, evidence supporting uh, the availability. Um, we also heard uh, and we talked quite a lot about how these reproductive rights are entangled with other rights, social and economic rights, uh, especially uh, we talked about poverty and the restrictions disproportionately affecting poor women. The, the, uh, the restrictions disproportionately affecting young girls and indigenous communities. We heard a very compelling, uh, compelling story from Egypt. And then we discussed also strategies and activities, how to counter it, one of them being litigation in India, advocacy, and quite interesting uh, story from Argentina about mobilization uh, and how, how it succeeded and, and how it is bringing forward social change. But, and this is also something that we are currently witnessing in Ireland. Um, and then we also heard about legislation being a very important tool. Uh, we heard an example from the UK. And then towards the end of the day, we talk, started to talk about the need for education. And uh, I could identify a couple of needs that uh, the so sexual and reproductive rights movement um, uh, are in very much need to, to continue working with. And one, one of them centers around narrative. 
we talked about whether language, uh, the rights language is a useful one, and the need to uh, put women and people in the center of our discussions. And I would like to highlight this because uh, one of the reasons why there is a pushback or the, one of the driving forces of the pushback is that there are populist governments in, in, in power in many of our countries. And these populist governments are using uh, their, um, their narrative to convince people, and they are relying on the majority of the people. So it is crucial to be able to reach wider audiences and, uh, and, uh, and uh, influence a wider constituency uh, when we are trying to hold back those uh, those pushbacks, and we and uh, I also identify the need to organize coalitions, and uh, we talked quite a lot about the disability rights movement in this room, and uh, I think a way forward is to really invite them to the table, and when whenever who, whoever is organizing the next conference, invite disability rights groups to the to the room because i very much agree with all of our speakers that uh, the the origin uh, of the disability rights movement is also a human right they are coming from the human rights movement and i'm pretty sure that uh, the intentions are very similar but it, there is a need to reconcile uh, and not to not to make the debate even more strange. So I very much see a need of coalition building and strengthening the, ver the relationship within the human rights movement, and especially in this case with the disability rights movement. And then finally, I'd like to highlight uh, one encouraging point that many of our speakers came back to, and it's about being ambitious. Uh, it's about not only attacking the backlash, not only fighting back, but also fighting for advances. Because we, we could see in, in the UK example that there might be a legislation passed in 1967, uh, but there is no revision, revision afterwards. So use the opportunities that are there to, to seek advances and not only to, uh, to stop the pushback. So with that, uh, I very much want to thank you again to Liam and Liam's team for organizing this event and bringing us all, all together. And I'm very much looking forward to supporting the brave initiatives that are coming uh, from this room. And I know from Liam that uh, the interventions will be shared with the author's permission on um, on ICCL's website as a starting point for further discussion. And as for INCLO, we will be uh, having a private meeting with INCLO members in the, tomorrow, and we will continue the strategic discussions that we started today. So thank you very much, and uh, enjoy your evening. Mm -hmm.